Ken Falk, welcome to Shrinkwrap Radio. Hey, David, thanks for having me on today. Well, I am so excited to have you here, really. Uh, you know, uh, you've written this book, which I should probably show to people right away. This is what it looks like. Reasonably thick, but not tiny print, <laughs> which is good. And uh, <clears throat> I'm so impressed by it. The title is Struggle Well, Thriving in the Aftermath of Trauma. And uh, boy, this, what, a, what a great book this is. And uh, you know, most, the majority of my guests come from the world of psychotherapy, psychology related things and so on. And uh, I'm very interested in you because you come from a military background and yet your book is certainly very relevant to the show and to our interests in psychology. And so I'm actually gonna focus more on you, your work, your life, than the book per se. Uh, although, because you, your life, your work is also closely tied into the book. And uh, <clears throat> so your book is about trauma. And in fact, you share with us that growing up, in fact, uh, you, you dealt with some, some trauma yourself. I should probably, you know, I mentioned the military thing. Well, we'll get to, we'll get to who you were in the military. Uh, but you do share that you had some trauma early in life, which maybe sensitizes you, among other things, to the whole realm uh, palette of trauma. Uh, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I grew, I was born in Pittsburgh and grew up um, in Virginia. My dad got out of the army and became a cop here in the DC, um, or Washington DC Police Department. And we had, we moved down from Pittsburgh in 1962. And, and um, in 1968, my mom was diagnosed with a very rare form of liver cancer. And in March of 1970, she died. Uh, when I was seven years old, just 25 days before my eighth birthday. Wow, and that yeah. is traumatic. Yeah. That's pretty traumatic uh, uh, to, to grow up uh, without a mom. Although a couple of years later, my dad remarried. I have a wonderful stepmother and a uh, new family, new part of our family. But my dad was left as a single dad, you know, uh, with me for um, a couple of years. My brother, my brother and I, my brother's three years younger than me. And because I was the older of the two, my dad would send me back up to Pittsburgh and I'd spend time with my, my grandparents up there. And I had a, a, a great set of grandparents, but my grandfather drank about five nights a week and uh, drank, over drank, and uh, was a severe alcoholic. He was also a World War II and a Korean War vet. Uh, and he was very abusive in the household, uh, physically to my grandmother. Uh, one of my uncles and him were very physical together. Uh, never to me, uh, but I witnessed it, you know, a lot to the point where I can remember as a young kid, as I talk about in the book, um, you know, trying to sleep with covers over my head to drown it out and not be able yeah. to sleep. Um, yeah. it, it stays with you for a long time, but, you know, it never kind of defined me, and, and, and I moved on from that. Um, other than that, you know, I, I led a pretty normal childhood. I, I was a very good hockey player. I left high school to try to play professional hockey. Um, that didn't work for me in, in 1981 after – a failed attempt to play in hockey, I enlisted in the Navy. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned that you were planning to be a professional hockey player, and uh, but somehow that didn't happen, and you ended up with a military career in the Navy, which given your background, you mentioned several family members who were in the military already, uh, so I guess it's not altogether surprising that you would end up there. Uh, how did you happen to go into the Navy? <laughs> Well, it's, um, uh, I, you know, I always tell people the military is a family run business. So, you know, we huh. tend, tend to do that. Um, but also I grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, right outside of DC in a very, very military neighborhood. And all my childhood mentors were, and my bosses, you know, the people I worked for were all military personnel, my scout master. And, uh, the military always had a huge impact on me and, and I just knew it was a good place for me. Uh, plus, I was on a downward kind of spiral after this failed hockey attempt. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. And everybody I talked to said, you know, the military really, you know, uh, makes you into a man. And that's what I was looking to become. So uh -huh. uh, why the Navy? I walked into an Army recruiter in, in Arlington, Texas, uh -huh. and he was at lunch. And, uh, and as I walked out, uh, the Navy guy grabbed me. And, uh, and basically, we sat down and talked. And, and 
he told me he could get me off the boot camp in about six weeks, and I was in a rush to to leave. And six weeks later, I was going through boot camp in Orlando, Florida. Wow. I almost was in the Navy. Uh, I got a, a partial college scholarship uh, through the Navy, but uh, decided not to take it because I ended up getting a scholarship that didn't have any strings tied to it. So, <laughs> so I lucked out. Is that a kitty I see behind you or a rabbit or what? It's white. I can, that's all I can tell. No, it's on your other side. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's my wife's uh, bald cat. One of those oh, hairless cats. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So where did you uh, end up serving in the military? Well, I, I started my career off uh, back here in Washington, D.C., in the Ceremonial Guard, um, the unit that does all the White House ceremonies and all the military funerals in uh, Arlington Cemetery. Uh -huh. And I was a casket bearer, uh, ca carrying uh, caskets uh, uh, for military funerals. And, um, and that's kind of where I started. I left that unit and uh, got recruited into something called EOD, which stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or what we refer to as bomb disposal in the military. And uh, in the Navy, all services have EOD uh, forces, but in the Navy, we also have a mission uh, to, to clear um, underwater ordnance. So all Navy EOD technicians are in fact divers as well. And we also have a mission to support the special forces. Uh, so all Navy EOD technicians are also parachuted. So it's kind of like a special forces unit. Um, yeah. But we do our job, you know, we work with SEALs, but we're not SEALs. We're the, we're the guys that disarm the bombs for the SEALs. So that's, um, that's how I ended up uh, uh, leaving Washington, D.C. And, and spending the rest of my career doing that. I assume you saw uh, Catherine Bigelow movie the hurt locker she won a, a, at least one academy award uh, did you see that movie i did see that movie it's a fantastic movie and i, got, I was able to meet Catherine once and she did a couple fundraisers for one of our charities uh, that i run today uh the eod warrior foundation and uh, i remember her standing on stage here in dc when she was going to show the movie and she said to all the all the military guys in the audience she said don't this is not a training film. This is a Hollywood production. <laughs> so, uh, so the movie, I think overall the movies had great reviews through our community, but you know, there are those guys that, um, that, 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 that don't necessarily appreciate Hollywood glam, glamify in our, our profession. But, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, the movie did well. It helped us when Catherine won her um, Oscar, right? For that yeah. I mean, uh, she only had on one piece of jewelry that night. It was a rubber wrist bracelet of our foundation. And wow. uh, one of the fashion magazines zoomed in on that and called us. They were intrigued by, uh, by the fact that she wasn't wearing somebody's diamonds or watches. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a very, very impressive lady and a very impressive film. Yeah, it was such a powerful film. I mean, it, the first, uh, it starts off in a really tense way. And... Uh, as a non-military person in the audience, you know, uh, I really felt like I was there and I felt all the, the uh, tension building up in myself and so on. And I know that some people in the military criticize it as being sensationalistic, but hey, it sounds like a pretty dangerous and scary job. <laughs> is it? It is. It's a dangerous. It's a very dangerous job. You know, I tell. It's like you know. It's like a firefighter. You know, there's there's a group of people that when their house is burning down, they'll run there and they'll try to put it out. And in the military and in the civilian world, we have civilian bomb disposal specialists in the police and fire departments around the country. But you know, when there's a bomb ticking, um, you know, these are the bomb disposal men and women that go down on those. Now, the great news today is robotics have become very sophisticated and we can get a, a much larger standoff than we ever used to. But, but there are many times still when, when bomb disposal personnel are, are literally leaning right over top of a, a very sophisticated device, taking it apart. And that's a, and that makes for a very dangerous job. The great thing about our training is it's great training and we, we are very good at keeping up with modern day threats and, and we do a good job overall of, of, of surviving, you know, all of these types of tasks. Yeah. And, uh, uh, did, were you at all traumatized by that work, do you think? I don't think so. I think I've been a little traumatized um, by the care. So 
um, my wife and I started this, this foundation called the EOD Warrior Foundation, and I've been taking care of severely wounded EOD troops um, since 2004. And, um, and I think some of that rubs off, you know, I, I think I'm more inspired than I am traumatized by uh -huh. men and women who have been physically injured and see what they've gone on to do some remarkable things from winning gold medals in the Paralympics to climbing uh, um, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Everest. Uh, we had a wow. single, single leg amputee climb Mount Everest to going back to college and finishing their college degrees at some very prestigious schools, Harvard, Georgetown. Um, so I think overall I've been much more inspired than traumatized, but, but from, you know, I, I broke my back, um, in 1989. I talk about that in the book as well. I broke my back in a parachute, uh, jump. I, I did suffer some, some traumatic, you know, nightmares and things about three or four months after that happened. I, I, um, but I, you know, I, I recovered fairly well and nine months later I was back on full active duty. So I don't, I don't ever feel like trauma has held me back from anything. And I think that's what our book's all about is really trying to teach people that, that trauma shouldn't hold you back. Uh, it's, it's something that we can't change. It's something that we can't get out of our head necessarily, but, but it shouldn't hold us back. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time though, I can see where working with people who had their limbs blown off and so on, at some point it's got to go through your mind at least occasionally wow you know uh that could have been me there and so i <clears throat> I, I could understand if you know you might have that reflection from time to time at least in the beginning now you've been yeah. doing this work for some time and uh and you cite plenty of reasons uh to uh to account for the fact that one need not be totally swallowed up by those negative experiences. And we'll be getting into that as we go along. Um, but in fact, it's extremely dangerous work. I think at one point in the book, you talk about, you give some statistics, I think, of around 300 EOD technicians uh, who had died within a certain period of time or were seriously injured and an equal number who committed suicide. That's correct. Yeah, we've had, correctly. Since 9-11, um, uh, we've had 134 EOD uh, technicians in all four services, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, killed in action. And we believe our suicide number has, has in fact, passed that uh, by a couple, probably around 136 suicides since 9-11. Wow. And, yeah. and in the broader military, it's very similar. It's... Uh, you know, 20 veterans a day that take their own lives by suicide. We've lost um, about 6,000 uh, troops in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and and, um, and 10 times that to suicide uh, since 9-11. Wow, that's, that's shocking, 20 a day. Do you, do you, do you know how that uh, compares to the civilian rate? So the civilian suicide rate in our country today is about 125 Americans per day. Uh, 20 per day? Per day. Wow. 20, of those are, 20 of those are military veterans. Um, a handful, again, of first responders, um, military, uh, uh, police force, and fire department. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a serious percentage of, of, of the Americans that do take their own lives. And uh, by the way, it's the suicide is the only cause of death in our country that's on the rise. Um, everything else is pretty leveled out, you know, and the opioid crisis isn't helping anything. So it's, it's, um, it's pretty bad. Yeah, really. You know, not to glorify war, but I'm wondering if you have a, a story or two from, uh, from your life in the mil military doing that dangerous work that you could share with us. Yeah, no, and I, and I don't think it's glorifying. I mean, you know, like like most soldiers, and um, none of us like to talk about you know what happens on the battlefield. But there are some experiences. I spent, uh, I did a two year exchange tour with the British uh, forces, and spent time in Bosnia with them. And uh, you know, Bosnia was really an ethnic uh, cleansing uh, uh, event, and and uh, the Muslims in Bosnia were 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 decimated. Uh, they were pulling up to, uh, to homes of Muslims and just opening fire and shooting everybody in the house. And uh, one of the most memorable things for me on my tour was one of the camps that I was in, 
we um, had two young boys who had survived a 30 caliber machine gun that had come through their house and killed both of their parents and took off the roof of the house. And these two boys were living in this house um, by themselves at, at ages probably nine and 12. And, uh, and, and to this day, I always wonder what happened to them. But I, I was able to sneak food out and, and, and stole a few pair of boots and some clothes and made sure these kids were, you know, had as much as I could offer while I was there. But uh, during the war, there wasn't a lot of relief uh, for Muslim families, and, and it was pretty brutal. And, and, uh, and, you know, Bosnia was really... I always tell people it was kind of an EOD man's war because there were hundreds of thousands of landmines and booby traps laid in that country. And, uh, and it was up to the military uh, bomb disposal personnel to go out and clear all that. And that's what our mission was while I was there. So, you know, nothing to glorify it, but any means, but every, you know, every war has a job for military personnel to do. And, and, and there's tragedy that, that always ensues. And, and, and every one of our military members in some form or fashion steps up to help, you know, but uh, there's great pictures of our troops, uh, medical doctors taking care of Iraqi and Afghan children, you know, and it's, 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 it's war's a, war's a terrible thing. And, and I think the one thing about warfare, modern day warfare is that the media has been embedded. And I think the American people have seen about as close as they're going to see of, of war without joining the military. So yeah, we've all got a job to do. And, and uh, I think it's, it's best, you know, I'm not a politician. I don't always agree with politically why we're there, but once we're there, we've got to do the job that we've been sent to do and, and try to stay alive and keep our brothers and sisters alive. Yeah. Now you, have you also served in uh, Middle Eastern countries? I have, but primarily as a contractor. So I, I retired from the Navy in 2002 and, uh, I started a counterterrorism consulting company, and my company um, supported all the war, uh, all the wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, Philippines. Uh, uh, even today, I've sold the company now, but even today, they support efforts in places like Syria and Yemen and all over the country. We were in about 43 different countries when I was the CEO of the company, and, uh, and, and I was in most of those as well visiting. Now, when you, when you say uh, I... Uh... A, a contractor, you know, immediately Blackwater comes to mind, and they've got a very bad reputation. Uh, I assume you weren't doing the work of a Blackwater we did, type. We, we did not do protection work. Uh, mostly, most of the contracts that Blackwater and Dime Corps and Triple Canopy had during the war were personal protection uh, contracts, where they were protecting U.S. bases, U.S. interests, and State Department interests. Uh, my company was mostly a technology company early in the war. We, we tested technologies on the battlefield, and then we even developed a few technologies. Um, and then uh, towards, towards the end of my uh, stint with the company, the last three years, we primarily became a training company. So our specialty was IEDs, improvised explosive devices. And we would do everything from very basic IED awareness training all the way up to the more sophisticated bomb disposal training. And that's kind of what our company, at the height of the war, my company was training about 45,000 soldiers a year that were going into harm's way. Wow. Wow. So that's one of the things that I was really impressed by in reading your book is uh, what a successful uh, entrepreneur and executive you turned out to be. And uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, you're a businessman. <laughs> you're, you're a philanthropist and a businessman. And uh, do you credit your military training for for that? I mean, did you, you how much of this is innate and how much of it is uh, skills that you learned while you were in the military? Well, you know, I think um, I grew up in a, in a large lineage of entrepreneurs. My, my great grandfathers were, uh, were, were business owners. My, my immediate grandfather my, on my mom's side, uh, owned a big company. My, my dad's father was a trucker. Uh, he owned a trucking company, one of the first refrigerated trucking businesses in the country. My dad, after my mom died, my dad left the police department and started a construction, <clears throat> excuse me, a construction company, which my brother went on to run. So, I mean, there was entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial uh, people in my family, for sure. I do think the military 
uh, uh, does make us a little more entrepreneurial. I um, uh, One of the things that really I think when you look at entrepreneurs, especially successful entrepreneurs, um, they really have this appetite and, and ability to manage and tolerate risk. And I think, you know, I had done a lot of risky things in the military beside, you know, being a bomb disposal personnel, I jumped out of a thousand airplanes, uh, um, helicopters, um, been diving, you know, in some of the darkest, deepest waters that the world has to offer and doing some pretty, you know, interesting tasks while I was underwater, not just scuba diving uh, to, to look at pretty fish, but um, that those types of missions are, are very risky and we learn how to manage that risk and assume that risk and still get the mission accomplished. And that's kind of what entrepreneur is, entrepreneurism is about. It's about, you know, having a great idea and then being willing to take that leap and, and execute it. And I, I do think the military, probably better than any other organization, you know, sets us up for success there. Yeah, I really got that impression that, that you had gained uh, skills and it's interesting as well to hear about the family background and uh, how those two kind of came together to make you uh, the uh, successful businessman that you've been. And um, at some point along the way, you became concerned about the psychological damage done to many veterans of these conflicts in the Middle East and uh, after coming back from the wars. Uh, so tell us about how that focus developed for you. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, my wife and I started this charity called the EOD Warrior Foundation. And when I left my company in 2010, there was this period in time, probably about two and a half years from about the end of 2010 until early 2013, uh, which, which were the worst years in Afghanistan for amputees. So most primarily because our operations in Afghanistan went dismounted, meaning that the troops were out of their vehicles and walking on the earth. And a lot of the IEDs that were found in landmines were being found by men and women stepping on them. So we, we saw a lot of damage in those couple of years. And all of the amputees, for the most part, all of the amputees would be medevaced back here to the Washington, D.C. hospitals. At the time, Bethesda Naval Hospital, if you were a Navy guy or a, a Marine, and then Walter Reed, if you were in the Air Force or the, uh, or the Army. And uh, now those hospitals have merged to one hospital, but back then it was two hospitals. And over a very short period of time, um, we had about 70 amputees back to back. So about every four days, my wife and I were visiting these families in the hospital. And as you can imagine, it's pretty tragic. Um, it's a pretty complicated uh, hospital stay, you know, unlike most of us, you know, God forbid, but if anybody, you know, like myself was injured today, I would be medevaced here to a local hospital, probably in Northern Virginia, and my wife could drive back and forth. But, you know, you imagine a young Marine who's stationed in Camp Pendleton in San Diego, deploys to Afghanistan. His wife and children are in, Afghan or in uh, San Diego. He gets injured, medevaced to Washington, D.C. She's got to find care for her dogs and cats. Now she's got to get her kids, get to Washington, D.C. Her parents want to be with her to support her. They come from, let's say, Iowa, and his parents are in Florida. So it's a pretty disruptive process, and people are quitting jobs, getting fired from jobs because they can't be there to work all sorts of stuff going on. So what our foundation primarily did was cover some of these emergency financial burdens that were caused by this disruption. And we also saw that the families, you know, were in very tight quarters. At the time, there weren't um, a lot of places for the families to stay other than hotels that were very expensive here in DC. So my wife and I started bringing families out to our house. We live an hour west of DC. And that inspired us about a year into it to donate 37 acres of our, our land and build the nation's first privately funded retreat center for military uh, and veteran personnel. And, um, and, and that retreat's called Boulder Crest. And that's, that's kind of what I spend most of my time on today is fundraising for the Boulder Crest retreats. We have one here in Virginia on our farm and we have one just south of Tucson, Arizona. And in the first year of the retreat, um, mission, our primary effort was what, what I would just refer to as respite, getting these families out of the hospital 
away from that terrible setting and into a more relaxing setting uh, in the country, you know, an hour away from the hospital. But about a year into that program, uh, we were actually holding a caregiver retreat and caregivers in, in this case were mostly young women whose husbands had lost their limbs, uh, except for this one young lady. And I had gone in to meet the ladies on a Saturday morning and there was one young girl sitting in the corner of our music room all by herself. And I asked her, I said, well, how's your weekend going? And she said, well, it's a beautiful place. I'm having a good time. But, you know, the truth is I wish my husband would have lost his legs. And my mouth just hung open for a minute. And I said, what do you mean? Right. And she said, well, nobody knows what's wrong with my husband and everybody else who's here in this retreat's husbands are amputees. And I said, well, what is wrong with your husband? And she said, well, he's got PTSD. And that's when I, you know, I knew something about PTSD. I told you my grandfather's story. Uh, um, I grew up here in, in D.C. in a very military area where I saw friends of mine whose fathers were Vietnam vets primarily and struggling after, after that war. And, you know, I'd read a little bit about PTSD as well. And all of us, when we get discharged from the military and you go to the VA, they always ask you about PTSD. So I knew a lot about it, but not enough. And, um, and by complete chance, the next day, my wife and I were in Frederick, Maryland having lunch. And there's a beautiful museum in Frederick, Maryland called the Medical Museum of the Civil War. And in the front window was this book titled PTSD in very large letters from the Civil War to Vietnam. So I bought the book and I read it and I kept thinking to myself, there's got to be something we can do. And, and, and I literally spent about two weeks doing some research on doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists who were doing maybe innovative work is, is the best example I could give you of, of, of interesting things in PTSD treatment, primarily for the military. But I didn't just look at the military. I was interested also in things that were going on and other war-torn countries. And I met lots of really interesting people and I started sending them emails and I asked them if I could come visit them. And I, I literally bought a plane ticket and went on this journey around the US. I went to Harvard, Chicago, San Francisco, Napa Valley, LA, uh, to UCLA, to USC, down to San Diego. And I talked to some of the most prominent psychiatrists and psychologists in the country. And I kept hearing things like, you know, what we're doing for PTSD doesn't work, you know, kind of akin to alcohol and drug rehab where we're getting massive relapses, uh, drug addiction issues uh, coming on from the prescriptions that were being uh, provided, increased suicide rate. Um, and I remember sitting with a couple, two very prominent psychiatrists in San, San Francisco at dinner one night, and the, and the lady, you know, the wife in this couple said to me, uh, the same thing. She said, you know, really, this PTSD treatment, the prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapies don't work very well. And I, and I looked at her and I just said, you know, I've heard this about seven times on this trip I'm on. I said, if they don't work very well, then why do we, why do we keep doing them? And without missing a beat, she said, well, it's the only thing that's approved in the DSM and it's the only thing the insurance companies will reimburse us for. And I just thought, you know, as a bomb disposal guy and a guy who comes from a profession where you just can't make the same mistakes over and over again, I just thought, <laughs> I just thought that was a terrible answer. And I said, yeah. you know, it seems to me that if something's not working, that we should be innovating in the space and trying to do something, you know, to change that. And that's kind of what led me on this journey. Yeah, yeah. The, going back to that woman in the music room, that wife in the music room, that was such a pivotal moment, too, and interesting for me as a reader that one of the things that you found out is that people who've lost limbs end up being more resilient uh, and doing better psychologically, uh, somehow reorienting themselves in ways that the people who are psychologically damaged by PTSD don't seem to be doing. Yeah. And that really was a part of the driving force of your book, right? Was to. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, fin paradox. I finished, uh, I finished that journey, you know, that trip uh, in North Carolina with a doctor named Tedeschi, a clinical psychologist named Rich Tedeschi. And Tedeschi had coined this term called post-traumatic growth, which I was really intrigued by. 
And I intentionally went to Rich last. I wanted to hear from these other doctors and get a feel because I had read some of Rich's uh, research. And when I looked at my own life, I kind of felt like, like I was kind of a post-traumatic growth picture, you know, that I had, I had been injured. I'd been, um, I'd, I'd, I'd witnessed some serious abuse as a child, but I was like, what, what made me able to come through this and, 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 and what's preventing others from doing that. So I left Rich's last and, and I remember sitting down and talking to Rich and I said, you know, most of Rich's research, by the way, was studying bereaved families, families that had lost children to cancer. And what he found was that they had gone on, these families had gone on to do some very remarkable things in the aftermath of the child's death. And not that any of them, including probably giving up their own lives, wouldn't have done anything to get their kids back. But that was impossible. And they had, they had, they had, come, to get, they had come to the conclusion that they had to do something for somebody other than themselves. And that was this whole concept of post-traumatic growth. And I said to Rich, I said, have you ever done anything with the military? And he said, well, actually, I, I did. My colleague and I studied prisoners of war from Vietnam. And I said, well, that's interesting. What, what did you find out? And he said, 30% of Vietnam veterans came home from war with PTSD. Now, that statistic, by the way, is true for our modern-day generation. Afghanistan and Iraq vets, it's about 30% of the force. And that's a huge number. Huge number. And, um, and I, he said, how many... How many prisoners of war do you think came home from, from Vietnam with PTSD? And I, like I said, I've been to combat. I've also been through something called SEER school, which is where we teach military personnel how to behave, how to potentially escape if you do get captured uh, and put into a prison camp. And, uh, and that, was, that, that school, SEER school, was taught uh, or created after the Vietnam War um, to, to teach pilots primarily and then uh, special forces uh, guys and gals that, that support special forces missions who, who are in the most um, uh, challenging of situations in respects to possibly getting captured. So uh, I've been through Sierra School. It's pretty tough. And, uh, and I, I looked at Rich and I didn't even hesitate. And I said, it must be 100% of prisoners of war uh, that had PTSD. And he said, nope. And I started going down. He said, no, it wasn't. I said, 90, 80. I got down to 30, which was equal to the to the rest of the force, and he holds up four fingers and says, no, 4%. And I said, what? And I said, how do you account for that? And he, he again, didn't miss a beat, and he said, training. And I said, well, what do you mean by training? Because, you know, like I said earlier, uh, at the height of the war, my company trained 45,000 people a year going into combat. And I know a little bit about training and how to scale training. And he said, you know, the, 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 men, the men that were in these prison camps taught each other how to create hope in their lives and how to manage the day-to-day -day trauma that they were going through, um, understanding that there was hope on the other side and that they would, in fact, get back to a life of, uh, at the time they thought, normalcy. And by the way, the, the, the psychiatric community told the families of those 591 men to be prepared to institutionalize them for the rest of their lives. Uh -huh. And they came home, and the complete opposite happened to what the psychiatric community yeah. told. Well, and one I, thing I'm, I'm noticing in that story is that it was a peer help situation, right? That's so, correct. That's correct. It was, uh, it, was, it was sailors and airmen, you know, pilots helping pilots. And, um, and, and, and the interesting, one of the most interesting things to me, which I only found out in the last year, uh, the four percent of POWs who who had severe PTSD were, in fact, the ones that were in captivity the least amount of time. Huh. So that that, along with the amputees' uh, recovery, started to resonate with me. Here I was; I had a young Navy officer who was blinded, and instead of letting that you know rule his life and sit on the couch, the guy was a swimmer in college. He signed up for the Paralympics and came home with four or five gold medals. I had an art, a Marine amputee who said, you know, this leg, just because I don't have a leg doesn't mean I can't live my life. And he climbed Mount Everest a year later, you know. So yeah, wow. I started, I start, I, we have a young guy that I talk about in my book, Taylor Morris, who lost all four limbs. And th this, you know, th this kid, when I first saw him, number one, I didn't think he was going to survive. And, and, and number two, I didn't think he was going to have a great life. And he's got an amazing life. He's back in his hometown. He, 
He spent three years after he got out of the hospital going to college and getting his bachelor's degree. He's got his own business. His wife's got her own business. And, and they're, they're just, you know, they're really doing great in the aftermath of their trauma. So I started seeing all of this and I thought, well, if, if, if these are potentially the worst case scenarios, what, what can we do differently? What can we do better for those with PTSD so that we can help them? And that's what led me on this journey. Yeah, one of the things that impressed me was that you uh, came away from it saying we've got to have a scalable solution. And you mentioned that in relation to your company and the military training, that the trainings that you had had experience with had to be able to process large numbers of people. And so you kind of brought that attitude into this work because the people that you you studied people who had one or another kind of innovative treatment, but they were one-on-one -on -one or one-on-ten. And uh, you said, no, it's got to, it's got to, we're losing ground unless we can come up with something that's scalable, which is really CEO talk. <laughs> so I was interested the way that you, uh, that that call to you, and that was a major part of your quest. Um, so how scalable is it? How many people can you handle and, and where does this need to go? Well, it's a great question. I, I you know, I, I think I tell people that from, you know, with any problem, you've got to kind of squeeze it. Most of what we do, most of what the medical community does is on the acute care side of, of PTSD treatment. And, um, and although what we're doing is in fact scalable, we've got to come back on this continuum and start to look at everything. You know, we talk in the book about ACEs, the adverse childhood experience. We know for a fact that the military uh, um, brings in lots of kids off the streets who have come from some pretty horrible family backgrounds. Um, how are we going to manage that a little bit different? We know in the military on the active duty side that there is a lot of opportunity and a lot of room for developing a, a leader that has a much higher level of emotional intelligence, which we believe is very important. The military has never put a lot of emphasis on, on emotional intelligence, but I think if we don't do that, we will continue to have bigger problems. Yesterday, I read an article that today, the Marine Corps uh, active duty troops has the largest suicide um, uh, numbers in, in, in the history of the Marine Corps. And we believe, as I do, that most military leaders believe that everything in the military is a leadership problem. So training leaders to be aware and understand and how to, how to you know, manage people who are dealing with trauma, all of that is something that we have to, to, to work on. And then the big area where a lot of trauma occurs, and not necessarily battlefield trauma, but a lot of trauma occurs is in the transition from active duty military to, uh, to the veteran status. You know, it's kind of like, especially in the, in the, in the, in the more sophisticated um, uh, military specialties, you know, special forces, pilots, um, where, you know, you pretty much have your Superman cape on and now all of a sudden it's kind of ripped off. And, and funny enough, we've seen a lot of parallels even in professional athletics, football players, hockey players, baseball players, uh -huh. transition off of the playing field and into this, you know, uh, less known world. You go so from the, hero to zero. Hero to zero, and 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 as as much as that's not true, uh, it, you can surely start to convince yourself that it is, uh -huh. and a lot of guys do, and they start feeling sorry for themselves. And that transition area is an, an area where we can really do a lot more. And the way the military transitions, folks, the primary goal in transition is to teach people how to get a job, and 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 in many cases, just getting a job after you retire could be one of the most detrimental things for your depression and anxiety issues. You know, if you don't think that that whole process out better, and, and the first thing you do is just go get a job to manage your, 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 your bill pain, um, you could end up in a job that you really hate and that causes a lot of problems. So we can do a lot better in the transition area. And then as you look in the veteran space, I think we need to train mental health professionals in, in the world of post-traumatic growth. I've been and the two big mental health conferences recently, the Texas Psychological Association and a global mental health conference in London. When I ask people if they've ever heard of post-traumatic growth, only about half the hands go up. Most of the ones that have heard about it don't know really what it is. 
So I think we need to train the mental health community better in post-traumatic growth because if you talk about growth, even in your even in your prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy sessions, if you start to talk about growth and possibilities, you can really change the, the dynamic of the patient. And I think that's important. And then also we just got to keep increasing and in scaling the, uh, the acute care work as well. But I think there's a lot there, but it's a continuum of services where we have the opportunity, I think, to, to have interventions all along this kind of continuum. Yeah, you know, I had heard the term post-traumatic growth uh, some time ago, and uh, in the context of the positive psychology movement uh, started by uh, Dr. Martin Seligman. And, but I thought it sounded to me like pie in the sky, you know, yeah. and that's what got me excited about your book was it was rooted in, you know, in concrete experiences and, and the kind of research that you were doing of just seeing what's actually going on. And uh, I found myself wondering if, if, uh, if you've had any exposure to Seligman or to the positive psychology movement. I have, and I'm, you know, it's, I, I always, um, I always chuckle when people say it. Cause I, you know, what I, what first comes to my mind when somebody says positive psychology, I, you know, is what, is everything else negative? You know, it's like, which isn't, isn't the case, right? I mean, the, the psychiatric and psychology communities, I think in, in some form or fashion are insulted by the concept that, you know, one guy, maybe thinks that, 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 that there's a better way. I will say in defense of post-traumatic growth, you know, um, Tedeschi's work was nothing about how to live a life of growth. Tedeschi's work was studying people that had transformed themselves through a variety of different ways. We were the first group to go to Tedeschi and say, hey, listen, we understand your research, but do you think that we can teach people how to achieve post-traumatic growth in their lives? And he was even, he even sat back for a minute and said, you know what, Ken, I'm not sure, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'm willing to help. And he's been very helpful. So I don't feel, I feel like what we're doing is training people rather than therapy in them. But, you know, I do, I do hear, I've heard from a lot of, of, of doctors, psychologists and psychiatrists specifically that, that the positive psychology stuff is a little bit insultive. Um, and I've seen some of the work that they've done in positive psychology in the army and, um, and quite frankly, I just haven't been that impressed, uh, not because of what I'm reading, but because of the execution. And I think that's one of the things that's been missing is that, and, I, and listen, I, I don't want to sit here on this, on this great podcast and tell you that I'm an expert in, in, in mental health, because I'm not. What I am very good at is training people and getting people to get to a place where they understand content and then can re-deliver that content to a bigger population. And and that's something that I don't think the mental health community has done a good job of. You know, the, the schools that teach psychology, psychiatry, and, and social work um, are pretty, pretty rote. I mean, it's the same stuff over and over and over again. And until a new approved treatment comes out, we don't necessarily incorporate that back into the curriculum. So I think that becomes, you know, if I put my, my bomb disposal hat on, you know, when a bomb went off in Iraq, and it was a new kind of bomb with a new kind of firing device. We got that bomb back into the classroom within, we tried to get it within 24 hours. Often it was 72 hours, but within 72 hours, the next group of bomb disposal personnel that were going into combat were seeing that new bomb. And that's not the case when you look at academics and the way, the way uh, college educations go. And, 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 and we have to teach the basics. The foundations have to be there. I get that. But there needs to be something in this in this continuing education process where we're we're really firing back and, and and putting successful programs into the curriculum so that people have an opportunity to learn what is working. Yeah, well, you know, your book has a lot of techniques in it and and approaches, attitudes, if you will. Uh, Really, I might summarize it as, as instructions on how to lead a good life, how to lead a satisfying, flourishing life. And uh, I've, I've, we've spent a lot of time talking about you and your background. Can you give us the 40,000 foot <laughs> view, uh, maybe take us through some of the, the principles that you uh, are putting across here in your book? 
Yeah. Um, so let's start with, uh, I think, the biggest, uh, the highest level of view, which is that we believe, uh, number one, that we've got to stop um, pathologizing life, uh, meaning that every, every depressive episode or anxious episode gets diagnosed and treated. Um, you know, we've basically created this medical model of, of what I would call a response to life. And I think, number one, we've all got to think and, uh, that that's not the right thing to do and probably come up with a better way. Um, we believe that normalizing um, the, this whole concept of, of depression and anxiety uh, and PTSD and whatever other moral injury, we hear them all. I mean, there's all sorts of names that come up. Every other day, somebody's coming. I just saw another paper on transition stress. So all this, you know, all this stress and all these, these names, military sexual trauma, if, you know, which could mean that you were raped in the military or it could mean that a guy put his hand on your shoulder or a girl put her hand on your shoulder and it offended you. So I don't want to downplay, you know, sexual harassment by any means, but when you label something, it's, it, it creates something that's unknown and how to deal with it. So we're trying to normalize life and, 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 uh, and have people understand that no matter who we are in life, your life is a series of ups and downs. You can literally map that out from the minute you're born, right? It's like, we don't know the unknowns, but we pretty much know the major things in life that are gonna happen. You know, you're gonna get born, you're gonna go through schooling, people in your family are gonna die, you're gonna get pets, those pets are gonna die, you're gonna buy new cars, those, those cars are gonna get wrecked. You know, and this is kind of the story of my life, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's up, ups and downs, and at some point in time, at the end of this, this, this sine wave of life, is, is your uh, mortality. Now, the, the issue is that, and one of the things that I really believe that the military is, is good at understanding after combat specifically, is that we do understand mortality very well. You know, when you come into the military and you get through all your basic training, you kind of feel like Superman, almost immortal. And most 19 and 18 and 17 year olds, maybe even 24 and 25 year old kids on Wall Street, you know, who just finished their MBA at Harvard, they, they feel like they're immortal until they get close to a, more, a, 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 a mortality issue, watching their father die or their grandparents die or whatever it might be. So you can map this whole life out. So if we all can normalize that and understand that we're gonna have a series of trauma in our life, then what do we do to really make that sine wave look more like a roller coaster than a, you know, than a heartbeat? And um, meaning spikes and, 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 and valleys um, versus this kind of rolling, you know, roller coaster of what life is gonna look like. So if we, if we can get to that place, then really, I think people start to understand that, that life is stressful. Life, as we say in the book, life uh, isn't hard, it's hard work. We've got to get through these work. So what we try to do is tell people that if you can imagine that this, this curvy line going down a, maybe a road where your car's curving a little bit, and, um, and the borders of that road, on one border, what we have to do to have a good life is to create... Um, what we would refer to in our book as wellness practices, having the ability to self-regulate uh, as an example. Uh, we have a saying that if you can't self-regulate, you self-medicate. And we know that once you're addicted uh, to alcohol or drugs, whether they're legal or illegal, it's very difficult to come out of those addictions. So, um, so wellness practices, and I'll talk a little bit more about our wellness model in a second, are, are one side of the road. The other side of the road is, is, is your network of people, uh, because we believe a couple of things. We believe, one, that humans, um, that humans um, are, in fact, uh, we do, in fact, thrive on relationships. So getting the right relationships in our life are very important. The other thing we believe is that we become the average of the three to five people that we spend the most time with. So obviously, if you're spending time with three to five drunks, you're going to be a drunk. If you're spending time with, with three to five entrepreneurs, there's a good chance that that might rub off on you. So having a network of people and mentors in your life that can help you along the way when times get bad. And I'm not saying, and I even say it in the book, I've got a group of friends that I love, love to go fishing with, love to have a beer with, but if something was bad in my life, I would not ask them for help, right? But they're fun. On a Wednesday night, 
you want to go bowling, that's the group you call. But if something bad's happened in your life, those aren't necessarily the guys I want to call. I've got my three to five closest friends that I can kind of disclose that to. Yeah, sure. And then to go back to the wellness practices, we believe that there's four critical areas of wellness in our lives that we've got to work on. And that's your mind, your body, your finances, and, and your, um, your spirituality. And what we do, uh, and we walk through this in the book, is basically show that in, in the shape of a triangle, mind at the top of the triangle, body at the bottom left of the triangle, and your, and your finances at the bottom right. And in the center is our spirituality, and that's kind of determined by a circle that touches the inside of that triangle on all three sides. And we, we teach people that you rate yourself on that tri wellness triangle on a scale of one to five. So on a, a one being the lowest, a five being the highest. On your mind, maybe a one is, you know, you can't remember anything. You're so confused because of the trauma. You're so dis distraught because of the trauma that you're in a, in a really bad place. That might be a one. A five might be, you know, your, your, your brain's working fine. You're sleeping well. You're meditating. You're reading books. You're increasing your wisdom. You're taking college classes. You know, that could be a five. On the body side, a one might be you're, you're very fat. You, you know, can't walk up the stairs without getting, you know, out of breath. You're, you're fighting diabetes, whatever it might be at the one level. A five might be that you're in the gym five days a week. Your nutrition is good. Your, your um, uh, hydration is good. Your flexibility is good. Uh, all the things that are going to lead you into longevity in your life are, are healthy. On the finances side, a one might be you're homeless. You're unemployed. You're struggling to make ends meet. You're struggling to eat. Uh, a five may be that you've got a great job. You've got plenty of money and savings. We try to keep it simple, maybe three to six months worth of cash flow in a savings account. If your air conditioning went out on your house tomorrow, could you in fact replace it without taking out a second mortgage? And finances, we added finances into our wellness model because we forensically looked at some suicides and there were a lot of suicides where the, where the, the man of the house had just thought he'd let the family down and thought that the only way that he was going to get better or they were going to get better was if he died and, and, uh, and they had his life insurance policy. Yeah, so, I was interested to see the finances in there because uh, I think that's unique to this model. And, uh, and of course, it's such a key thing. It's a key thing to the quality of your life. And, and, yeah. and again, it's something that the medical, uh, medical model doesn't address. And uh, for a lot of reasons, one is that, you know, there's probably a lot of people sitting on the other side of the table, you know, on the psychiatrists and psychologists and social worker side that are struggling financially as well. And it's hard to give advice from a place where you're not, where you're not healthy. And then in the center of the ball is a spirituality. And we define spirituality in three, three, three ways, not in a non-religious way. One is character. Are you living a life of congruency, meaning that your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions are positively aligned? That's character, honesty, integrity, all the types of things that positive psychology brings, these 24 character strengths. Um, the second is relationships to others. Are your relationships good? Are they healthy? Are you in a good place with them? And then the third element of spirituality is service to others. Are we doing something for others? So a one in spirituality might look like you're very selfish. You're not doing anything for anybody else. You're, you're not living a good life. You're, you're doing things that are going to end, up, end, end you up in jail or prison, worse off. And a five might be that all those areas are very strong. And obviously, there's a two, three, and four in every category. And what we believe is if you look at that triangle, the outside of that triangle is really our egos as a human. You know, how smart am I? How good looking am I? How much money do I have? But in the center of it, even, even though the triangle geometrically, geometrically is the strongest shape we know, um, that triangle will collapse if nothing's in the middle. And we see this over and over. And conversely, you can see, and we give an example of Haiti, you can see where you have very spiritual people, very religious people, where they have a belief system, they have a philosophy of life, uh, they do things for other people, where you, can, you, could, you could live a life spiritually that doesn't have anything on the outside. And I think you see this in places like Haiti where they're, they're uneducated, they're, their bodies are, are emaciated because they have no nutritional value or exercise. And financially they have nothing, but a hurricane hits their place, 
Uh, they rebuild the place together. Their spirituality lifts them and keeps them up. So I always give people this kind of analogy that, you know, imagine you're in a gym and you're sitting on one of those balance balls doing your workout. You could sit there pretty much all day until one or two things happen. The ball deflated or um, you fell asleep. And, um, and, and, and quite frankly, that's your spiritual ball. And I think if you can keep that inflated, you can, you can have a lot of strength inside. So we always teach people to work on your spirituality, work on your character, work on your relationships, and then let's sharpen the points of our triangle through a series of very short-term goals that allow you to focus on each one of the areas. So if I'm trying to increase my, my mind, then maybe one of my goals is that I'm going to read one book a month. If I'm trying to increase my body, maybe I'm going to walk a mile a day to just get my exercise routine going. If I'm going to start to increase my savings, you know, maybe it's I'm going to find a job and I'm going to put, you know, 5% of my, my, my income away in a savings account. So short-term goals, what we know about people who set and complete short-term goals is it in, helps increase your mental toughness what some people might refer to as resilience. I don't personally like the word resilience when you talk about humans, but what it does do is it really helps you increase your mental toughness. And I think that mental toughness helps you get through trauma a lot better. Yeah, what, I, I love everything that you're saying. I'm curious what it is about the word resilience that rubs you wrong. Yeah, um, well, first of all, the literal term of resilience is, is really the ability to bounce back. So, which I think, number one, is impossible because we never go backwards in life. We don't want to go backwards. Um, so I'm very growth orientated. I'm very focused on, you know, teaching people how to thrive in life rather than just survive. And if you kind of looked at a, a, a spectrum of resilience, it just kind of gets you back up to the surviving line, right? So, so I'm, I'm plugging along in life. My car, my, my car gets wrecked. And I got to go get my car fixed and financially it's going to cause me problems. It's going to cause me problems at job, my job. But, you know, what do I do? I bounce back and I have a car that's been repaired, right? So that's all that, that, that really happens in that scenario. That's kind of surviving. But what I want to do is be able to come back from these traumatic experiences and be better. And how do you become better? You become better by sharpening that triangle and, and, and doing things for other people, you know, and, and that's, that's really what it is. I always tell people is once you get through a traumatic experience and you feel like you're healthy again, the best thing you can do for others is to turn around and help them through their journeys. And that in itself, Tedeschi would say in the world of post-traumatic growth, that's what he would refer to as an expert companion. And I give an example, the, the Newtown, Connecticut elementary school shooting, a horrific um, incident. Those families that lost children, they have a task force in Newtown, Connecticut now that when there's a school shooting in the United States, these parents go to those sites and will sit with the parents and do nothing but listen and share their experiences of their loss this many years after the incident. So it's important. That's post-traumatic growth. That's, that's the expert companion turning around and helping somebody else through their journey of, of trauma. And that's really what we hope for. And I think uh, and, and one of the things that, that doesn't always occur in the medical model is, you know, there's a lot of people in, in social work um, and, and psychology and psychiatry that, 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 quite frankly, aren't healthy themselves. And if you're not healthy and you're trying to help somebody else, um, nothing good comes out of that. Nothing good for you as the provider and nothing good for the patient. So we believe strong, strongly that, that you have got to be, you don't have to be a five in every one of those areas of wellness but you've got to be very healthy to be able to, to help other people because the truth is hurt people will hurt people. And, uh, and that's brutal. You know, that's a good place for us to wrap it up. I think you've given us a wonderful uh, tour through the book there and uh, uh, the work that you're doing uh, personally as a psychologist, I find very inspiring. And uh, so keep it up. And okay, so Ken Falk, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Thanks, David. It's an honor to be here with you, and uh, thanks for your feedback on the book. And uh, if anybody needs me, you can you can see the book at strugglewell.com is our website.